Hello, David. We're coming to you. I'm from coming to you from Germany again, and I've got another great guest for you today. I'm joined by Robert Henley, Bob Henley, who is an award-winning print and broadcast journalist. He's written for just about everybody that you can think of from uh, CBS Money Watch, WNYC, uh, Pacifica, CBS to 60 Minutes, Miami Herald, Detroit Free Press, you name it. Bob has probably written for them on labor. And of course, that's something that we care about deeply on this show. So Bob, welcome to the David Feldman Show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So we're bringing you on because you just have a new book published. And I think that it's a very important book. And listeners, you know, I say that there's important books all the time. I, I read a lot, but we have a, a great endorsement from another person who you're probably familiar with and who I've interviewed on the show before, Professor Richard Wolf, uh, who I was corresponding with. And that was who put me in touch with Bob. So let me just read this briefly as a testimonial to this work. We're talking about Bob Henley's new book, Stuck Nation. Richard Wolf, which as uh, YouTube listeners can see, Bob is holding up right now on the screen. Richard Wolf says this new just released books author, Bob Henley, is one of the finest investigative reporters in the U.S. He worked for CBS, New York Times, NPR Pacifica, and many other news systems. I cannot recommend it more highly for research and teaching purposes. A superb thinker, writer, and social critic, this is the latest in an expanding Democracy at Work book publishing project. Much more information is available on the website at democracyatwork.info, and this is published by Democracy at Work. So, Bob, we're going to talk about your book, Stuck Nation, Can the United States Change Course on Our History of Choosing Profits Over People? I guess the first thing that we should ask when we get into this conversation is, you've been using the moniker Stuck Nation for several years at this point. Right. Can you just tell the listeners briefly, because of course we'll expand on this, what you mean when you say stuck nation? I mean that for a nation that considers itself a democracy that's propelled forward by collective decision making, by every external measure, we seem to be making no social progress. And I say that as someone who's been practicing as a journalist, I'm 65 to be 66 this month. I started when I was 17, and over the arc of that time, what I noticed is that when the public gets agitated about something, when it's inspired to take action, all too often the forces of capital um, kind of run down those energies of change, and we end up with exactly the same situation we had, or even worse. And I would say that the circumstance of working families is the most um, obvious exhibit. So in the 70s, uh, we saw that there was a major change, which I'm sure your listeners are aware of, where uh, through technology and the advancement of um, the productivity increased dramatically and the ability to generate wealth for workers grew exponentially. But what happened in a betrayal of Americans that is still living to this day that wealth went to the top into increasing concentrations that more and more became stateless. And both political parties supported, I call them the concierge of multinational capital. Our nation became about protecting the formation of large wealth. Maybe it was always about that, but I can only talk about middle lived history. And so no matter how much we are aware and write about and come to terms with this issue of uh, social inequity, we seem incapable of making some changes. Although I have to say right now at this inflection point, I'm more optimistic than at any point in my life that we're at a key turning point in American history. It's interesting that you say that, Bob. I have a few questions planned, but that last statement that you made makes me want to stick on that for a second. So you say that you're more optimistic at this point than any time in history. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm much younger, but I would agree that this is a moment that we do have some cause for optimism lurking in the background, but that, of course, is still being tamped down by the forces of capital, as you said. Right. Just yesterday, we saw uh, Nina Turner, for example, who was running in Ohio's, I believe, 11th congressional right. district, being defeated by someone who is being funded by some of the worst of the worst people, right. huge money donations coming in. So even though there's this cause for optimism, it's not going to be an easy fight going forward. Um, so, Bob, I just want you to expand briefly on why you're seeing such optimism now, because I agree with you, but I want to hear your perspective on sure, why. First of all, as now. I say to a younger person like yourself, 
I'm really sorry about the planet. Um, so I, I, I would guess that uh, what it is is that we coming out of this pandemic, which in many ways is an idea of my lived experience because we're seeing a mass death event on a scale we have not seen where over 600,000 uh, Americans, many, many tens of thousands of essential workers who ended up giving their lives and in some cases even um, undermining their family's health by going out to work in an environment that um, where the, uh, the coronavirus got a foothold. Um, what is happening is that this is causing uh, an existential question to be called about the nature of work. And so in some quarters, it's being called the great resignation, right? Because uh, people are reevaluating what the worth of their life is. And the, and the beat that I cover in the civil service in New York City alone, uh, close to 400 civil servants died in active duty during the pandemic. And when I use the phrase active, active duty, it takes on the sense of military service. But these are people that were repairing fire engines, people that were EMTs. And so now people are looking at their lives and seeing what uh, the implications are of this, this moment and saying, no, you know what? I think I'm going to uh, do something else now. And so uh, at the same time, there's been this grassroots awakening for a few years. I mean, I watching um, uh, AOC be successful in New York City to defeat an incumbent congressman like Mr. Crowley, who was one of the most powerful Democrats in, in New York State. And then to see that replicated down ballot throughout the country, uh, that gives me a sense that people are activated like they haven't been before. Similarly, in conversations that I have in the book with Reverend Barber, who talks about this third reconstruction, uh, the success that President Biden had, and even in Georgia with the election of the two Democratic senators, was in no small measure because of the courageous um, engagement by low wealth and, and low wage workers who turned out. And yet the potential is that there were so many millions of them that didn't turn out. And now we're really focusing as a nation on the importance of working with them. And I'm seeing a, a labor coalition across the social justice spectrum that I have not seen before. And so after the tragedy of George Floyd, which show, showed the, the unexpiation of America's original sin of slavery, we saw the American labor movement join around the country with very um, progressive statements. So you're seeing a kind of alignment of the issues and it's even happening in the workplace with what we see now with the great news that the, uh, the National Labor Relations Board investigation shows that Amazon uh, engaged in illegal behavior. And so the workers there will get another shot of the union. So it's really happening across the board. And you're right, we're feeling great resistance. And in fact, the violent insurrection by the reactionary white supremacist forces is an indication not of how strong they are, but of how weak they've become. Yeah, I think that that's a good point. But I, I, okay, I want to move to a, um, a similar topic. So two part question, then you mentioned that there are agents of change that perhaps are coming in right now that we haven't seen for a, for a while in the past. So here's the two part question. First is when in your mind, and you alluded to this a little bit, but I want to pin you down a little bit more. Sure. When in your mind did America become stuck? Uh, because I think that there would be uh, quite a bit of, you know, debate on that specific point when America became stuck, assuming that most people would agree with the overall point that right. America at this point is and then the second part of that question is somebody who many people thought might have been an agent of change. And you write about this in your book was Barack Obama, who you right. had the opportunity to interview when he was right. a then senator. Right. Can you talk about that moment as well as at that point, you would have already thought that we were in this stuck moment. Right. What was your perception of then Senator Obama, who many people saw as a potential agent of change to get us unstuck? So I'll deal with that second part first, because uh, just to set the scene a bit, in 2008, uh, I was this, uh, one of the senior political reporters at WNYC, which is the NPR station in New York City. 
then Senator Obama was going up against then Senator Hillary Clinton, certainly a favorite daughter uh, in the primary contest. New York State was really energized uh, uh, by this contest, setting all kinds of records for voter engagement and registration. It was in Senator Obama's interest to give an interview to the local public radio station. Uh, I had an opportunity to freely associate with him. We got stuck in traffic, wonderful. So what was supposed to be five minutes became 15. Um, at first blush, I had I'd been covering the campaign. I'd covered Senator McCain. I had seen a kind of deterioration. I did enjoy McCain's candor on the campaign trail, but he had deteriorated. He was not in the same circumstance that he had been over the years. And uh, Senator Obama uh, was extemporaneously brilliant, able to just talk about the geopolitical situation. But in questions I was asking him about things like, say, the need back then for the United States to shift its policy of this kind of um, draconian uh, uh, criminalizing of drug abuse and moving more towards an enlightened public health community wellness take, I found it to be a telegenic moderate, you know, quite frankly. Uh, and so, but certainly there, there was rhetoric of hope and change. And in his physical person, he represented a shift in terms of um, the visuals, right? But then, because I'm a beat reporter, I had to cover what was actually happening in Patterson and in Newark. And the the, four, uh, the irony is that as African Americans had the significant um, breakthrough of having an African American elected president, I, this resonated with me because I'm a Catholic guy, then a kid when John Kennedy was elected, whoo, all things are possible, right? So there's that feeling. And yet when you actually look to see at the lived experience of so many African-American households, because of the predations of Wall Street on Martin Luther King Boulevard and on Main Street, they were losing their homes and not by a small number. And so those places I covered since I was in my 20s, I saw street conditions continuing to deteriorate, the proliferation of zombie homes and the response of the local governments, often in control by local Democratic politicians, was to raise the taxes on the people who were dealing with this downward cycle where once foreclosure and abandonment happened, the people that were still trying to hold on to their homes saw, who, by the way, got it against redlining, right? So you saw a kind of concentration of the original sin building and tearing down these neighborhoods. And at the same time, within a matter of, I'd say, by to, uh, scroll forward to Zuccotti Park, and to occupy Wall Street, some of the same young people who were so enthusiastic were even active in, in, in uh, President Obama's election, would then put everything at risk, disrupt their lives to push back on Wall Street because they saw that we had rewarded them for doing what we asked them to do, which was to go to college, by saddling them and yoking them with huge amounts of debt. And they were living in their parents' basement, being denied the agency that they should be entitled to. So that's that's really what put a fine point on stuck nation for me was watching the arc of these young people so energized by what could have been a transformation election. And then moreover, the thing that was so problematic was that at the same time, there was, well, there was this physical change in terms of imagery of President Obama in this fundamental issues that were important, the further notice war, global war on terrorism. We saw a continued expansion of it, the further notice war. Even as we saw the um, and building on the lives of the Bush administration, and we were disconnected from the fact that we were setting off this huge refugee crisis on a scale not seen since the Second World War, and then not being connected to the fact that our economy was stuck because the recession wasn't adding the kind of growth historically uh, periods of uh, expansion were supposed to, because we were squandering hundreds of billions of dollars on this war that had no end with borrowed money. That would be a stagnation. Bob, so I'm gonna jump in and you, you mentioned a bunch of things that need to be done to get us unstuck, but I wanna narrow our focus on a couple of them. So you write that things that needed to be first uh, fixed first in order to get unstuck include campaign finance, government right. bureaucracy, unemployment and underemployment, the stagnant economy, public infrastructure, education, right. healthcare, law enforcement, immigration, agriculture, right, right, right. the environment, right. international relations, right. on and on and on. That's, this is what you write. But there's a few things that I wanna narrow our focus on because they've been things that have been mentioned on this show before. Right. The first is 
media perception. I think that one thing that really is keeping us as a stuck nation is the way that the, the ma mainstream media particularly, but even some public media is portraying our recovery from uh, the Great Recession. For example, we've, right. been, we've been pitched this idea that people are uh, living in luxury now, that the recovery is well underway. It's complete. We're better than we were back in 2007. And you point out, you've been following how things have been going in New Jersey, for example, talking right. to average people in New Jersey. And as you can see, both on those anecdotal experiences, right. as well as the statistics, that is not really what's happening, but that's what we're being pitched in the media. So I'm wondering if you can talk about how that media perception is keeping us as a stuck nation. And also, if you want to weave in, talk about the public airwaves a bit, because that is something that we've talked about on this show before. So I would look at news reporting as fundamental uh, function is situational awareness, right? To put it in terms of that's its value, its strategic value. We listen to the news or weather because we want to know uh, how to be guided by what is anticipated. And so that could be anything from now these days, the rate of transmission of the COVID virus to whatever a weather front is coming by. And similarly, social conditions are based on how that um, on information that's reported back to us. Well, consider that when I first started 17 years old for the Ramsey Mara Reporter, a local newspaper covering land use and um, the police blotter, um, in addition to the 17 year old form of myself, there were other adults. There were people who were older than myself, who were in the world, who actually were reporters. And there were three or four reporters at every public meeting whose job it was to hold accountable the local authorities in terms of land use and talk about um, uh, police accountability would go to the police stations proactively and asked to see the police logs. Now, we didn't get the information. So often they'd say no major activity reported. And the more enterprising one of us would put a police radio in our car. But the reality is that it wasn't left to, like we saw with George Floyd, the courageous young woman who was a civilian who videotaped with that horrible event. And so over time, corporations have gobbled up more and more local newspapers. And so the model, like Gannett, one in five American newspapers they now owned by Gannett, fire the local reporting staff, replace it with a handful of individuals. And instead of covering one or two towns, you now cover a county. Then increasingly what you do is you take news from utilities and local governments, strip off the fact that it came from an official source and aggregate it as news you can use. That is what's been happening in America. An example would be a, a news director I'm close to, WBGO, a great public radio jazz station in Newark, he worked for a general uh, interest radio station, family owned at one point that covered the Jersey Shore. And he built it up to the point that there was several reporters going out and covering radio news, gave the newspapers a run for their money. And yet it was bought by a huge chain, the radio station was. And he heard from some listeners that a terrible storm came through, like a near twister. And the local people were unaware of it because... The national chain, which I'll remain unmentioned, um, was broadcasting the weather from Southern California. That's what's been happening. So we and that to some degree, that disconnect between what we filled it with is what I would call this analytical based bias confirmation stuff out of Facebook. Um, and then combines like Fox are not about informing or challenging. They're about reaffirming and generating activity. They're not, they don't grade what quality is, they're just looking for the numbers. And so what they do is they pre-select for you what you're gonna see based on your existing bias. Doesn't sound like the basis for education, but for propaganda. And this manifests itself on the right and on the left. And so what's important is to have a um, context like this where we are um, independently coming up with information. That's why it's important. There's a union movement growing in the newspaper business where, for instance, often local communities could lose access to their own lived history that's been recorded in the newspaper. Writers are finding out that if they don't have a union. They can lose access to the archives that reflects the work they've done for a community. And once you blank out the archives of the community, 
Well, that's one way of really enforcing authoritarian control. You own people's future if you can erase their past. Yeah, Bob, let me just say that the the model for most corporate media is not education. It's indoctrination. Right. Uh, and Fox News being a prime example of that, but right. it is by no means exclusive right. to Fox News. Right. Uh, I'm just wondering if very briefly, because I have a couple more things I want to sure. cover in the last 10 minutes that we have, if you can talk about the corporatization of the public airwaves and sure. public radio, for example. Sure, sure. I mean, that's one of the things that um, I, I, the national public radio model, um, I've done a lot of work both for NPR WNYC and been featured on all those different formats. It's one of the places where you will still find reporting on poverty, immigration. That said, one of the problems is that in the case of WNYC, historically, it was a municipally owned broadcaster. Over time, with scarcity, with that Margaret Thatcher mindset of privatization, there was pressure to move the municipal uh, broadcast entity into a nonprofit model. And while listeners are important, increasingly what's happened is, and this is true of the public radio, public broadcasting model in general, that corporations and nonprofit corporations uh, can also be, uh, have the predilection of paying huge salaries. And they start reaching out towards corporations. And so around public radio had this whole problem, which they were transparent about, but only after it happened, the Sackler family was able to do a lot of uh, image washing through buying time on uh, public radio for what they call the halo effect. The other piece of this, and I do think that there's a course correction now. I do think that that Purdue Pharma thing, uh, because it produced such devastation in terms of the number of lives lost and a lot of litigation. I do think that there's now an awareness where listeners now are pushing back and people need to know that there's usually in a public radio station, a listener advisory board. And that's another place that you can, as an individual, show up. And I saw in the case of WNYC where a fracking company was trying to do this image washing and this halo effect of Williams Pipeline Company and a group of concerted disciplined, well-researched, well-spoken environmentalists actually was able to turn the tide at the station. But the other big piece of this, and, and you have to, because uh, the public radio is only really such a small part of media in general, is that one of the things that's happened is that both parties have, as you know, the airways belong to the public. And under the Clinton-Bush period, and just pretty much no one's pushed back on who's been in the White House, it's turned into a property right. And so you can have the foxes of the world actually do things antithetical to the public interest with bad health information, as we've seen. And there's no way to hold them accountable. And getting back to that underlying premise that the airways belong to the public, in essence, it's a public trust. And because through campaign contributions, the, the media conglomerates have been able to base, basically purchase our governance. Uh, we haven't hold, held them accountable. Bob, we've got about six minutes left, and I've got two questions left that I want to try to get sure. through. So let's see if we can get to both of them in sure. the remaining time. Sure. So one, and this is a big question, so I'm very sorry for giving you limited okay. time on it, but uh, one of the things that you highlight as being one of the causes of our stuckness is the obscene spending on the military. Now, unsticking this is going to be very difficult. And this is something that I've talked about on the show before. And I think David's talked about it as well, is that saying that we want to cut the military budget. First of all, it's essential. I, let's not minimize the, the fact that we need to, minim, to, to reduce the military budget. But it's really hard from a political standpoint because the military budget is spread to contracts in almost every con congressional district in the country. And this is something I've harped on. You can have uh, any representative from any congressional district. And if you have them saying that they want to reduce the military budget, there's probably a military contract agent uh, company in their district that says, we're going to lose jobs from our constituents if we cut these uh, military budgets. Can you just talk briefly about 
the necessity of cutting the military budget for unsticking this nation and sure. perhaps expanding on, on that final point uh, a little bit, if you would like to. Sure, in two and a half minutes or less. Um, I would say that it comes down to uh, developing uh, through uh, engaging the public in a new risk threat matrix. That is to define in real terms the things that really threaten us collectively. And then suggesting that it's not that there aren't, we, we're not, we are in a dangerous world, but what are those risks? And so it's important, for instance, to point out that we spent hundreds of billions of dollars and extended uh, American hegemony around the world to places we didn't even know our soldiers were located, and yet almost lost the whole um, thing to a group of white supremacists that we say we didn't see coming. So that's number one. Number two, let's look at what's really been killing Americans. So in the last um, three years, there was a decline in life expectancy in the United States. Last time that happened was during the last, leading up to the last uh, great death event in 1918 in the Spanish flu, where ironically, a Democratic president from New Jersey, Woodrow Wilson, another white supremacist, really true, he suppressed information about the uh, the infectious disease as well, because nothing kills a, home, uh, a troop welcoming party as telling people that your troops coming to their country are infected. And so what I would suggest is that this is our country has been ha had a chronic illness that we've accepted is just, you know, and to this day, for instance, do you know that there is no national requirement that every town have an emergency medical service? To this very day, it's a patchwork, can be voluntary in some places, minimum wage, and other, other places highly trained and well compensated. So what I'd suggest is that we look, for instance, at things like climate change, where we are seeing imminent already conditions on coastal areas and inland areas where we've been uh, prone to flooding. I explain to people, yes, these are threats to national defense and that require a shift in investment. Bob, I'm going to ask a very provocative question to, to close this out just for fun. So if you don't, if you don't want to go too deep into it, don't worry about that. Um, but in my mind, one of the things that's really been keeping this country by this country, I mean, the United States, I'm not there right now, but right. Uh, one of the things that's been keeping the United States as a stuck country is the fact that there is no accountability of former officials. We almost never see former officials regardless of what they've done, whether it's something egregious like, uh, you know, sexual harassment, Cuomo's in the news today right. uh, with this new probe that's come out, or whether it's things like money laundering or we, we almost never see these public officials having any sort of accountability that they're facing. People that have gained a hundred million dollars right. in office, uh, which as a public official, do you, in your mind, and again, feel free to, you know, tiptoe around this if you don't want to be and the too clock is on my side. <laughs> yes, exactly. That was why I was saving it for the end. Right. Um, what, do you, what do you think about that? Do you think that we need to have significantly more harsh accountability measures for former public officials in order to kind of push us out of this stuck moment? I would, I, yes, I would believe that we should at least, I, I did a piece when, uh, being from New Jersey, New York as a reporter, I've had ample opportunity to write about corruption cases. And one of the things I've come to understand is that we look at political power here more in a feudal sense that um, if you surrender power, that's punishment enough. How often have we heard, well, he's paid a high enough price. He lost his job as governor. You fill in the blank. And yet there is, it does create, like I think Mike Taibbi gets through some of this about this two-track accountability, how white collar criminals who destroy entire neighborhoods uh, with a balance sheet are, are lauded, right? Or even they're, they're considered philanthropists and we ask them what we should do with our future while people that may still loaf for bread or jump over a turnstile because they can't afford the mass transit fare, which usually, by the way, is the pet debt, debt service that goes to Wall Street. And so I do believe that there does need to be this kind of common sense standard and that offenses committed in public office, that that should be perceived as an aggravating factor, much like the possession of a gun when one is convicted for a felony. Because you've weaponized public trust. Yeah, absolutely. 
We're out of time. I just encourage you. This is my pitch, uh, you know, a little bit self-serving here, but we've been talking about the stuckness of the United States. And one of the things that you point to is um, the necessity for organized labor to again, have power. We recently did an episode of the Guerrilla History podcast, podcast that I co-host with Professor Adnan Hussein and Brett O'Shea of Revolutionary Left Radio um, with uh, Professor Emmanuel Ness uh, on his new book, Organ. Organizing Insurgency, Workers' Movements in the Global South, which is an absolutely fantastic book. And listeners, if you're interested in workers' movements, you really should listen to that interview. It's like just over two hours long. So if yeah. you don't want to pick up the book out of the out of the blue without having an idea of what you're getting into, it's a good starting point and will give you an idea of some things that haven't quite worked and some things that actually are pretty promising. So that's my pitch for that. Look up uh, that episode, which came out. Uh, maybe th three weeks ago, uh, Guerrilla History Podcast with uh, Emmanuel Ness, Organizing Insurgency. So we're out of time. My guest Thanks. again was Bob Henley, author of the new book, Stuck Nation, Can the United States Change Course on Our History of Choosing Profits Over People? That book is available from Democracy at Work. Bob, tell the listeners how they can find you on Twitter very briefly. Sure. Well, at Stuck Nation, because evidently we still are. I mean, this vaccination conundrum, I think, makes the point. Exactly. And uh, yeah, I, I would love to carry on the conversation. But like I said, we're out of time. So David, we'll turn it back over to you.